They will become my best warriors, completely devoted to me. It's as if I mold them out of clay and burning them in the crucible of war. They will be endowed with an iron will and steel muscles. I will put them in solid armor and give them the most powerful weapons in their hands. Neither diseases nor vices will touch them, and infirmity will not stain them. They will use such tactics, strategies and machines that no enemy will defeat them in battle. They are my bulwark in the midst of the surrounding horror. They are the defenders of humanity. They are space marines loyal to me, and they will not know fear. The Space Marine Legions are advanced assault infantry troops consisting of tens of thousands, and in some cases much more biochemically and surgically enhanced super warriors, armed and equipped to the best standards of the Imperium. The value of each Legiones Astartes is greatly compensated by their small number compared to other regular troops. They are all killing machines, never tired. Fast, strong, brave, disciplined, as well as sharp-sighted and more deadly than any other ordinary soldier, no matter how experienced. But once in a well-coordinated formation, Space Marines become a truly formidable force. Several hundred warriors are able to pacify the city in a couple of hours. A thousand can conquer worlds in a matter of days, and tens or even hundreds of thousands can exterminate entire species and turn civilizations into dust and memories in a period of time not exceeding a full rotation of terror around the sun. In total, the Emperor created twenty legions, and although the fate of two of them still remains one of the greatest mysteries of the Imperium, the rest covered themselves with glory during the Great Crusade. And despite the fact that the legions were created with only one purpose to conquer the galaxy, they are still very different from each other. Each legion inherited the traits of its genetic father and under his command acquired distinctive features and features of combat doctrine. And a formidable army of seraphim came in black robes and with dark wings, and each carried a whip in one hand and an hourglass in the other, and brought the army of heavenly punishment, and before their inexorable wrath, the worlds turned to ashes. The Dark Angels were the first among the Legiones Astartes of the Emperor. And in their earliest incarnation, in the early years of the Great Crusade, as well as in the dark campaigns that preceded them, they fought as the personal army of the Lord of Mankind. They were the prototype of what would become the Legiones Astartes, the model for the more specialized legions that would come after them, and the standard by which their heirs would be judged. They were once considered the largest and most powerful legion, but their numbers have fallen, and their superiority has been put to an end by decades of fierce battles, especially the Rangdan Xenocide Wars, one of the most apocalyptic companies of the entire Great Crusade. The scars of those battles will change them forever, as will the subsequent reunion with Primarch Lion L. Johnson and the infusion of fresh blood from his adopted world of Caliban. This planet was ruled by a militant feudal society of techno-barbarians, whose military orders became fertile ground for the restoration of the Legion, and chivalric codes and practices were favorably accepted and widely spread in the resurgent Legion. Unshakable, technologically advanced, ruthless and isolated by the time of the Horus heresy, the Dark Angels had once again become a powerful and extremely independent legion, accustomed to acting independently and conducting full-scale campaigns and combat operations to bring harmony. Wary of the intervention of the First Legion, the War Master arranged so that when he put his insidious plans into action, the Dark Angels would be on the far border of the Imperium, where they would not be able to interfere with him, at least for a while. However, in the course of the heresy, this legion will make itself felt, emptying the ranks of the Night Lords on Tramas and crushing treacherous worlds throughout the southern zone of the galaxy in the later years of the Era of Darkness. However, the Dark Angels do not have pronounced preferences in strategy. After all, within their legion, a unit or an entire wing was provided for each task. It was with the aim of achieving such universality that the hexagrammaton principle was introduced into the Legion. The hexagrammaton is an expression that denoted the six divine principles in ancient terror. 
This designation was given to the modern principle of the organization of the great armies of dark angels. In the Legion, he was installed around the year 830 of the 30th millennium. It was then that the nominal strength of 100,000 warriors was reached. But at the same time, many of the original armies perished because of losses in wars and because of flaws in their doctrines. The surviving armies were declared to be the purest and most fully expressive of the strategies and tactics developed by the Dark Angels over a long history, deserving the right to be immortalized in the annals of the Legion. And indeed, when Lionel Johnson reunited with his genetic sons and saw how effectively the Angels of Death began to work, he decided to save the Hexagrammaton. The Primarch only transformed the hierarchies of warriors so that they looked more like the chivalric orders of ancient Caliban, who had conquered the dark forests of the planet by that time. Lion L. Johnson became the Supreme Grand Master of the First Legion, and the former armies changed their name to Wings as a sign of acceptance of the traditions of Caliban. Words could not describe such a performance. No code of honor could explain why the Emperor's children, who used to be proud of their military excellence, turned to such madness. The Emperor's children have always aspired to be a model of military art, standards of military virtues and superiority, and shunned those who did not meet their standards, perhaps unattainable. That's why they were looking for perfection. A flexible, lightning-fast army whose battles are destined to win because of precise strategic planning and impeccable execution. The Emperor's children were always in search of the most serious challenges to prove themselves and thereby gain even greater fame. In their quest for excellence, the warriors of the Third Legion loved to demonstrate their superiority by fighting alongside brothers from other regions, which made them the most adaptable of all legionnaires. However, over time, the pursuit of perfection degenerated into the usual arrogance, which over and over again cost the Legion a very considerable amount of blood. From iron cometh strength, from strength cometh will, from will cometh faith, from faith comes honor, from honor comes iron. Iron warriors are grim and heartless experts in military science. They embody strength and discipline aimed solely at the systematic destruction of the enemy. The Primarch commands the Legion as if it were an extension of his own body and mind. And the will of each legionary is completely subordinated to his vision of a winning strategy. In this region, the priority of duty over the life of an individual warrior is more noticeable than in any other. Legionnaires are a resource that the inexorable mathematics of war consumes as easily as bullets or cartridges of Las Cannons. Guided by this doctrine, the Iron Warriors have become one of the most relentless and stubborn siege armies in the ranks of the Legiones Astartes. And during the Great Crusade, their guns turned countless fortresses to ashes. Nowhere in the universe is there a fortress that could withstand the onslaught of Perturabo's warriors. The legionnaires of the Fourth Legion are recognized masters of sieges and assaults, lords of trench warfare and geniuses of field fortification. The Iron Warriors march, the ground will be riddled with craters and torn apart by the tracks of a huge number of the most diverse armored vehicles. The sons of Perturabo have always adhered to the concept of mechanized warfare, and even the Horus heresy could not change this. However, Iron Warriors are also very good at defense, which they have demonstrated more than once in battle. For example, the famous Iron Cage almost became the final triumph for the Iron Warriors, and only the intervention of the Ultramarines saved the Imperial Fists from destruction. There is only one unforgivable lie. The lie that says, it's over. Now you're a conqueror. All that remains is to build high walls and hide behind them. From now on, the lie says, the world around you is safe. All emperors are liars. A flash of lightning from a clear sky, a sudden storm coming from an unexpected direction. The white scars embody the swift and merciless onslaught of war. Speed of action combined with enjoyment, high-speed offensive and clash of blades are the hallmarks of their battles, held back by a quiet and hidden wisdom that few have managed to uncover. White Scars enjoy being in the chaotic heart of battle, anticipating its vicissitudes and moving with the flow, constantly finding themselves where the enemy is weakest and least expecting an attack, and leaving only cold corpses in their path. 
They were the pathfinders of the Great Crusade, the cold wind flying ahead of his closed armies, culling the weak and driving the strong so that those who followed them could more easily crush them. Many of the victories of the Great Crusade could not have taken place if not for the deeds of these warriors. The heirs of the nomads from Chagoris, the White Scars are the exact opposite of the Iron Warriors. Where the sons of Perturabo thoroughly break into the ground and methodically mix the enemy with mud with massive artillery fire, the Khan's warriors prefer quick strikes and instant retreats. They are true masters of maneuver warfare, and their tactics fully embody their nomadic heritage. The White Scars are highly mobile, even by the standards of a space marine, and specialize in using attack bikes, land speeders, thunder claws, and other fast technology to deliver lightning attacks. Motorcycle riders often use a special power weapon known as a power spear in their attacks. As a result of the White Scar's tactics, heavily armed enemy forces often have to chase their shadows, while space marines attack the weak points of enemy troops. White Scars prefer to attack from afar using their speed and firepower to destroy the enemy. But if necessary, they do not avoid close combat. It doesn't matter how high your walls are. It doesn't matter how many will answer your call. It doesn't matter how much your blades shine and how brightly the flame burns in your hearth. The wolf is waiting. The wolf in the dark is waiting for all of us. Renowned for their savagery and devotion to the will of the Emperor, the Legion of Space Wolves has long stood apart from other Legionis Astartes. Distant and aloof, they were distinguished not only by their belligerent nature, but also by an almost impenetrable web of myths and allegories invented by them, which well guarded the secrets of the Legion, not only about who they were, but also about what they did in the service of the Lord of Mankind. The unique space wolf gene seed, modified by interweaving what is known as Canis Helix, had its advantages and disadvantages. It made the wolves more bestial than their fellow Legiones Astartes, turning them into extraordinarily gifted hunters and fierce killers, most susceptible to instincts and impulses, and for critics more animals than people. Despite all the ostentatious ferocity, the wolves did not lose their sanity at all. Like their ancient Terran ancestors, the wolves of Fenris liked to sneak up to enemy positions, then quickly attack, announcing the area with a long wolf howl, and at this very moment any enemy of humanity is already doomed. After all, even if he manages to survive this battle, Russ's warriors will chase him to the very edge of the galaxy, even if it takes millennia. For others, the Great Crusade is long over. For us, it will not stop until all the worlds of humanity are united once again and until the golden age of the Emperor returns. In the honours gained by devotional service to the Imperium, Imperial Fists are second only to the noble Ultramarines. Since the beginning of the Imperium era, they have steadfastly fought against all threats, remaining unyielding where others retreated, and often ended up sacrificing themselves in the name of honour and duty. The inflexibility, steadfastness and dedication of the Imperial Fists have long been legendary, and their Primarch, the mighty Rogal Dawn, is revered in all corners of the human state. The Imperial Fists carried the Emperor's word throughout the Great Crusade, and when Dawn returned to Terra, he was entrusted with the design and construction of the defences of the Imperial Palace. Since then, the Imperial Fists have held the honorary title of Guardians of Terra, and although they rarely return there, Terra itself is officially considered their homeworld. There is no one more experienced in space battles than the Sons of Dawn. From controlling giant battleships to violent skirmishes in narrow corridors during boarding, the warriors of the Seventh Legion have never known their equals. When fighting on the surface of planets, they prefer to act defensively. And although the Iron Warriors are somewhat superior to them in this art, the Imperial Fists have been the strongest barrier between humanity and its enemies for 10,000 years. My sons, the galaxy is burning. We all bear witness to a final truth. Our way is not the way of the Imperium. You have never stood in the Emperor's light, never worn the Imperial Eagle, and you never will. You shall stand in midnight clad, your claws forever red with the lifeblood of my father's failed empire, warring through the centuries as the talons of a murdered god. Rise, my sons, and take your wrath across the stars in my name, in my memory. Rise, my night lords. 
Even before the massacre in the Istvan 5 landing zone, the Night Lords were formally considered renegades, fully dedicated to the art of murder and horror. They attack with such ruthlessness and rampant brutality that they bring entire continents to their knees. Since there was no mercy to be expected, only a few of those who opposed the Night Lords survived to tell their stories to the rest, unless their escapes were carefully planned to sow the seeds of even greater fear. The Legion, which had a dark disposition, needed an equally ruthless leader to tame its propensity for atrocities, at least until the time came for them. The Primarch of the Night Lords was considered one of the most terrifying sons of the Lord of Mankind, a cunning and persistent stalker, a murderer who followed his own code of honour and cared little about what others thought of his methods. Conrad Kurz, also known as the Night Haunter, also possessed a share of the Emperor's foresight, a curse that haunted the Primarch all his life and sent the Night Lords on the path to their own destruction. However, they were still space marines, and even after the Horus heresy swept the galaxy, the Night Lords were ready to meet their fate with sharp knives and cruel hearts. For the most part, the Night Lords are skeptics. They have no single purpose, no single faith. They are not bound by the code of honour and the bonds of brotherhood. They go to war only to rob, kill and intimidate those whom they despise. Most of them, but by no means all, are not interested in chaos and avoid the company of those who worship it. They use terror tactics and prefer pirate and predatory raids. Their desire to inspire fear is the centre of their philosophy. The Night Lords have made intimidation a ritual. They decorate their armour with symbols of death and horror, such as skulls, skeletons, winged mouths, lightning and so on. Any advantage gained over the enemy including psychological, is extremely important for the Night Lords. As a result, most of them have at their disposal an extensive arsenal of personal weapons, often elaborately decorated, ancient and extremely deadly, and they are highly valued. The basis of the Night Lords' intimidation tactics is superiority. They try to gain an advantage over the enemy before attacking using psychological warfare methods, covert operations and ambushes. Although the Night Lords enjoy the carnage they cause, they will not engage in battle just for their own pleasure. They only fight when they intend to win, easy and quick. They are the sons of an angel, a bloody army, defenders of humanity. They are strength, they are nobility. They are blood angels, and I tell you that they are the most loyal and tenacious servants of the Emperor alive. In battle, the Legion of Blood Angels was the embodiment of the Emperor's wrath for those who rejected the gift of unity. Their appearance often seemed to be nothing more than a trial of the guilty handed down from above. Their appearance in the human worlds that had not yet been brought to Imperial compliance marked a brilliant landing on the strongest points of enemy resistance. Descending from the skies on wings of fire, the Legion crushed enemies with supernatural fury as well as a characteristic aura of horror and awe. As a result of their attacks, the chosen targets were cleansed of all life. According to eyewitnesses, entire worlds fell to their knees, cowering in horror before the anger and splendor of these red angels, not wanting to perish under their flaming blades. However, no such mercy was shown to the Xenos. Upon meeting them, the wrath of the Blood Angels was like a tide of relentless slaughter, which subsided only after the complete extermination of the enemy. Despite the fact that during the Great Crusade, the warriors of the Ninth Legion were often compared to the sons of Fulgrim, the events of the Horus Heresy forever changed the face of the Legion. Any combat doctrine and any, even the most elaborate plan, can be crossed out by a sudden attack of black rage. Now the Blood Angels are known as one of the most ruthless orders of Astartes, and some of their affiliated orders have long acquired such a reputation that ordinary people sometimes fear them even more than any Xenos. Weakness must be eradicated so that humanity can survive. Only force can be trusted, my sons. Our will must be like steel, our determination like adamantium. And these truths cannot weaken even for a moment. We are the few who have been entrusted with the sacred duty of ensuring the eternal rule of the Emperor. So be it, whatever it takes. Iron Hands are masters of combat vehicles using guns and tanks with the skill of an experienced swordsman wielding a blade. 
Proud and unyielding, the Legion fought for many years on the front lines of the Great Crusade and won countless victories, although many considered them as cruel and soulless as the machines that used iron hands with such destructive skill. They are known for their frequent use of bionics and their reverence for all things mechanical, making the iron hands closely associated with the Adeptus Mechanicus. A distinctive feature of the Ferris Manus warriors is a fanatical love of all kinds of technology. The March of the Tenth Legion always takes place to the accompaniment of the roar of tank engines and deafening gun volleys. The Iron Hands have always adhered to the concept of total war. By establishing a wide front and forcing the enemy to stretch their forces, they methodically grind it, after which they go on the offensive, finally overturning what remains of the enemy after long days of shelling and orbital bombardment. Because we couldn't be trusted, the Emperor needed a weapon that would never obey its own desires before those of the Imperium. He needed a weapon that would never bite the hand that feeds. The World Eaters were not that weapon. We've all drawn blades purely for the sake of shedding blood, and we've all felt the exultation of winning a war that never even needed to happen. We are not the tame, reliable pets that the Emperor wanted. The wolves obey when we would not. The wolves can be trusted when we never could. They have a discipline we lack because their passions are not aflame with the butcher's nails buzzing in the back of their skulls. The wolves will always come to heel when called. In that regard, it is a mystery why they name themselves wolves. They are tame, collared by the Emperor, obeying his every whim. But a wolf doesn't behave that way, only a dog does. That is why we are the eaters of worlds and the warhounds no longer. Of all the Legionis Astartes in the Emperor's service, the World Eaters were considered among the most intimidating. One whisper of their appearance was enough to stop the mutiny and make the armies scatter in terror. There were countless stories about their cruelty and ruthlessness, and they were considered the Emperor's warhounds, as they were once called, beasts, butchers and madmen, whose rage was only signed by bloodshed and against whom no sane warrior would dare to speak. They have earned their reputation by right. However, this did not mean that they did not know the strengths of tactics and weapons, at least before their fall. Close combat has always been a favourite form of warfare in the Twelfth Legion, even before the Emperor named it the Warhounds. But this did not mean that the Legion lacked the ability and competence in remote combat, the use of armoured vehicles or artillery support. Even such a master of mechanised warfare as Ferris Manus praised the armoured attack of the Warhounds on Aldebaran Septus, calling it a perfect example of rage, shaped and iron-clad. However, for the Twelfth Legion, such things represented a tactical opportunity to achieve the goal, and the purpose of this was to successfully deliver the Legion's main deadly force, its Space Marines, to a place where they could inflict maximum damage and grapple with the enemy at close range. The clearest sign of this Legion's love of carrying death face to face was the mass of melee weapons that its wars usually carried. In addition to the ubiquitous combat blades and gladiuses, even Legionnaires attached to reconnaissance squads and equipment crews tended to carry chain blades, spare knives, axes and cleavers. In specialised assault units, this abundance of murder weapons was complemented by weapons dating back to the Technobarbarian tribes of Terra. A chain axe with a wide blade. With the arrival of Angron as commander, the predilection of the World Eaters to bleed in hand-to-hand -hand combat increased even more. The Lord Gladiator taught them how to wield new weapons and kill in new ways, and what can only be described as the cult of individual combat has strengthened at the core of the Legion. Under Angron's leadership, the chain axe was refined and gained such a reputation, especially given its effectiveness against bestial creatures like orcs, that it became widespread in several other legions, but in abstract form, this weapon can be considered as a symbol of the World Eaters themselves. A cruel and savage, merciless and not elegant machine with the sole purpose to kill. The Ultramarines have become known as a model of what Astartes really means. They crushed the enemies of humanity, fighting like an intricate and perfectly tuned combat machine capable of quickly and decisively defeating any enemy. The Legion of Ultramarines fought the Emperor's wars with the help of prudence, discipline and determination. Each warrior tried to imitate his Primarch in everything. 
This most numerous of all the Space Marine Legions was a long-time defender of the Empire's possessions in the Galactic East. Being immensely loyal to their Primarch robot Gilliman, the Ultramarines blindly follow the Codex Astartes created by him. For 10,000 years they fought as described in the pages of this holy scripture. Other orders can easily take Gilliman's words out of context and adjust them to suit themselves, but not the Ultramarines. The Codex Astartes is a work of great wisdom, and these warriors see no point in contradicting it. Unceasing examples of self-sacrifice and self-discipline allowed the inhabitants of Ultramar to carry sacred knowledge and faith through 10,000 years into the future. The Codex Astartes contains hundreds of pages of descriptions for every conceivable tactical situation on the battlefield and many options for solving the problem. Each warrior of the Order learns the contents of the Codex by heart so that the whole company acts as a single organism. The wisdom of millions of Imperial generals, soldiers and officers is concentrated on the pages of the Codex Astartes. In it, a warrior can find everything from heraldry and insignia to instructions for conducting a planetary assault. It was said that there is no such strong poison, no such powerful poison or infection that could defeat the Death Guard. From the very day of its foundation, the 14th Legion had to follow the Emperor and fight in the most hostile worlds, in chemical clouds and acid streams where no ordinary person could survive. And Barbarus, the adopted world of Mortarion, and the base planet of the Legion contributed a lot to this. Both the Primarch himself and his Death Guard were immune to any harmful influences. During the years of the Great Crusade, the Legionnaires of the Death Guard were steadfast and unyielding warriors, able to survive in any conditions and win in the most nightmarish and hostile worlds. Their name was synonymous with the unyielding determination and victories they won in bloody hard battles when everyone else was retreating, as well as their mastery of the dark arts of war such as biochemical and radiation weapons. During the Horus heresy, Mortarion and most of the Death Guards supported Horus, becoming one of the nine legions of traitors who rejected the Emperor. After the betrayal, the Death Guard fell under the influence of the Chaos God Nurgle, who filled the armor and bodies of the legionaries with rot and plague, and elevated Mortarion to the rank of a demon prince. The main force of the Death Guard was primarily infantry, while heavy combat support units provided fire cover, and later numerous dreadnoughts and terminator detachments, which began with the Dusk Raiders and provided reinforcements and infantry wedges. Also, for this reason, the Legion became especially famous for clearing the Space Hulks from Xenos infection and the ability to destroy enemy fortifications and citadels from the inside. The Death Guard used armoured troops, support vehicles and transports. Since Mortarion did not want his marines to be bypassed or cut off due to their absence, but they were not given an important place in the strategic doctrine of the Legion. The only exceptions were specialised siege engines, such as the disproportionately large number of Vindicators, as well as the massive use of squadrons of Felbades and Land Raiders. In retrospect, it can be seen that the relatively high number of tank crews of the Death Guard Legion at the beginning of the heresy originated from Terra, whereas the heavy infantry, usually numerous Legion Storm Space Marines equipped with Terminator armour, hailed from Barbarus, which played a prominent role on Istvan III. The Death Guards have never had a battle cry. They are the Plague Marines, who are the epitome of virulent epidemic, devastating disease, silent death, and the inexorability of decay. They are the epitome of pestilence and smallpox, decay and decay, infection and disease, and all such things that are the most terrifying and come without a single word or warning. The minds of gods are not for mortals to know or to judge, except that Zinch has a place for all of us in his grand scheme and be happy in the part you have to play. The Thousand Suns is a legion closely associated with occult knowledge, mysticism and extraterrestrial psychopowers. It was the esoteric arts of war that made the Thousand Suns one of the most powerful legions, but also one of the most suspicious, which would eventually result in their condemnation by the Emperor. After the final transition of the Thousand Suns to the side of the forces of chaos, 
Some changes were made to the organization of the Legion, but they did not have a direct impact on combat training. They previously sought to avoid close combat, preferring witchcraft and long-range weapons. The development of the theory of Chaos Warlocks and the influence of the Ahriman rubric have only strengthened the desire for this approach. Space Marines influenced by the rubric deploy the main firepower of the attack, while Warlocks use psychic power, building clever combinations around them and combining their plans with powerful sorcery. For Primarch Magnus the Red, knowledge was power. He believed that there was no discipline that he could not comprehend perfectly. There was no secret that he could not reveal and make serve his purposes. For the Thousand Sons, knowledge became salvation, the ability to control unstable forces inherited from the Primarch's gene seed. Every book was sacred to them, every text was worthy of study, every document was a significant resource. The highest value was psychic power, the path to final initiation, the key to power over the universe. Before the Horus heresy, the Thousand Sons displayed ostentatious dogmatism, swearing oaths of allegiance and singing imperial hymns. They fought for the expansion of the Emperor's kingdom. But as their oath of apostasy showed, their highest loyalty was not to the Emperor, but to their Primarch. When the higher wisdom eluded Magnus and he fell into the clutches of the chaos god Zinch, those of the Thousand Sons who believed like him could not help but fall with him. And thus, driven from holy terror and residing forevermore in the underworld, the Sons of Horus, the treacherous Sixteenth, became the Black Legion. From shame and shadow recast in black and gold reborn, the combat doctrine of the extremely aggressive Sons of Horus was to use superior forces directed to where the enemy was weakest. These crushing blows were used to completely destroy the enemy's command staff, important structures, strategic purposes and trample on the enemy's pride, often with one precise and merciless attack changing the course of an entire conflict. The Sons of Horus used this ruthless doctrine very effectively. And like the wolves they were once named after, they swiftly struck at vulnerable places, surrounding and ruthlessly destroying few or unprotected enemies before they could recover from the shock of a sudden attack. A while later, after the defeat in the Horus Heresy, henceforth ashamed of their name, they were renamed the Black Legion by their new commander, Ezekiel Abaddon, who later became known as Abaddon the Despoiler. Since then, the Black Legion has been acting as a multitude of disparate small gangs and factions throughout the galaxy, uniting only at Abaddon's call to participate in another Black Crusade. The Sons of Horus are the legion from which the heresy began, the first, if not in betrayal, then in dishonor. Its name sounds like a curse on the vast distances separated and war-torn possessions of mankind. Because of the crimes they committed, it is easy to forget that in the past they were completely different, and once, together with their treacherous lord, they were revered above all other soldiers of the Legiones Astartes, and also pleased the Emperor's gaze. Born on terror as the 16th Legion, they will gain greatness as Lunar Wolves, and fall into the abyss like angels from an ancient myth named after their Primarch. But until those dark days, they had fought alongside the Emperor on terror, and in the early stages of the Great Crusade, and they were filled with the same determination and courage as all the other warriors. Their actions served as an example of what it means to be a warrior of the Legiones Astartes. Cruel, ruthless, unshakable, but also noble, and once selflessly loyal, their story tells of the aspirations of the Imperium itself, and the flaws that eventually destroyed dreams of unity and glory. Speak the words of Lorgar, and you shall live forever in the glory of chaos. Speak them not, and every one of you shall die today. If earlier the 17th Legion carried the light of the Emperor to ignorant humanity, now the word-bearers spread only the blinding darkness of the old knight. Guided now not by duty and honour, but by a thirst for forbidden knowledge and undeserved power, they seek to subjugate the warp itself and enslave its inhabitants. When the word-bearers march to war, the fabric of reality is distorted, and the terrible creatures of the abyss enter beside them. Meeting with the word-bearers foreshadows madness, death, and the curse of the eternal soul, unknown to most but the worst fate. 
If there is a hierarchy in betrayal, then the word bearers are at the highest of its circles. Not only did these once most loyal and devoted warriors fall by themselves, but they also dragged the fraternal legions with them into the abyss. The betrayal of the others happened like a storm or the blossoming of a long-buried seed, but the betrayal of the word-bearers was a poison that had been accumulating for many years. Since their foundation, their devotion to the Imperium and the Great Crusade has not been questioned. They were the bearers of the ideals of the Imperium, its vision for the future of humanity. Their loyalty has never been questioned, only the form of service. However, now their loyalty could only be seen as a mask, and their fanaticism was a flaw that was destined to undermine everything they sought to create. As time passed, the atrocities committed in Lorga's name rose to new heights, and he was encouraged by his patrons to join the demon community. Now he really became like a god, and the cry of his rebirth announced it all, echoing through the starways from warp space. From the demonic world of Sycorus, Lorgar watches over his legion, directing its myriad wars and skirmishes, conducting the monstrous corruption tearing apart the Imperium from within. Unlike most others, the word-bearers remained a united, albeit loosely organized, legion. Each of Lorgar's champions combines the qualities of a fierce commander and a priest of chaos, being called the Dark Apostle. Each of the armies given to him, called a host, is approximately equal to the order of the Adeptus Astartes and can be deadly during raids on the Imperium. They will not let me down, they will come back from the fire, and it will always be like this. Salamanders are the embodiment of a sense of duty trapped on an anvil. Skilled craftsmen, as well as holders of formidable and uncompromising honor. They are ready for work and sacrifice, and go into battle with the best weapons and armor, often forged by the salamanders themselves. The Legion used its working tools as weapons of war, with heat, iron, and brute force, overthrowing all those who dared to deny the Imperial truth or tried to undermine the foundations of the Imperium of Mankind. So, at an early age, salamanders learn the craft of a blacksmith. Each of them is able to maintain and make minor repairs to their weapons and armor, which gives the artisans of the Order free time to create new products, technologies, and metallurgy. As a result of the above, the Salamander Legion has an unusually high number of expertly crafted weapons, upgraded armor, and even tactical dreadnought armor. The Order also prefers to use land raiders of the Redeemer model. Nocturne's changeable gravity has also left its mark on salamander training. It is quite difficult to use land speeders and motorcycles in such conditions, so the Order hardly uses them, preferring Terminator or Devastator squads. Salamanders never give up or retreat. They can continue to fight even if their entire squad has already been killed, holding positions for a long time. This is one of the most significant effects of the Promethean doctrines on the psychology of the Order. Before each battle, salamanders receive a marking mark applied by a marking priest. This symbolizes their respect for the Order, and veterans are branded even on their faces. Although salamanders follow the Codex Astartes, they are also followers of the doctrines of their own Promethean cult. The cult, which originally arose as a form of the teachings of the Primarch Vulcan, set out in writing and in the form of various rituals, formed the basis of the doctrine, which regulated and promoted the spirit and culture that the Primarch wished to convey to the Legion. This thoughtful, allegorical work was based on the philosophical thoughts and martial art of ancient terror, as well as on the rich culture and mythological history of Nocturne on which Vulcan was raised. The foundation of his teaching was based on the fact that the Legiones Astartes were created for a single and unchanging purpose, the protection and liberation of all mankind, and that each of them was a formidable weapon that took on physical and spiritual form purely to achieve this goal. They were a living tool, forged and tempered on the anvil of destruction and the hammer of war, and the blade that took shape in the fire of the forge. The teachings of the cult proclaimed the main virtues of self-confidence, loyalty, duty, patience, understanding, self-sacrifice, and above all, discipline and endurance. The symbol of fire was taken from the culture of Nocturne, which meant creation and destruction, and the symbol of the hammer and anvil became the emblem of the cult. Vulcan forced the Legion to change its attitude towards the asymmetric way of warfare 
that the 18th Legion had previously practiced, moderating the warrior's desire for self-sacrifice by understanding how it could turn out in the longer term. In addition, thanks to iron discipline and relentless training, as well as excellent equipment, the Legionnaires have mastered the battle at close range and conducting operations in the Zone Mortalis. It was under Vulcan's leadership that the Salamanders became famous for their skilled craftsmen, creating magnificent weapons starting with bolters which are armed with ordinary warriors and ending with merciless weapons of destruction which were carried into battle by the dreadnoughts of the Legion. Each weapon was the epitome of deadly beauty as well as a model of form and functionality. Accordingly, the Salamanders had a large number of units equipped with specialized weapons. This was especially true of the flamethrower squads, including the unique elite pyroclasts, which were armed with prototypes of extremely adaptive fire projection weapons. So many of our brothers from other orders are proud to stand up to the fury of the enemy. Under fire, they show their superiority in stamina and endurance. We Raven Guards are not prone to such boasting. We kill the enemies long before they get the chance to cause us all sorts of senseless losses. The Raven Guard consists of light as well as darkness. The Legion is quick to bring justice and revenge to tyrants and oppressors, striking from the shadows with lightning speed and discouraging power. In the annals of the Great Crusade, there are almost no stories about the exploits of the Legion, because it always shunned glory. Despite the fact that the Raven Guard is capable of conducting any kind of combat operations, they prefer tactics of waiting and cunning. Raven Guards are masters at reconnaissance and infiltration, identifying enemy weaknesses, as well as delivering swift strikes with carefully calculated force. The Raven Guard strictly follows the paragraphs of the Codex Astartes, although it often uses special developments in terms of tactics. The Raven Guard's military operations rely heavily on scout squads capable of fighting behind enemy lines for a long time, as well as rapid deployment marines such as assault squads with jump packs. Most often after scouts gather the necessary information about the enemy, Raven Guard Space Marines land their tactical squads with the help of drop pods and thunderhawks. Since the main strength of the order is covert operations, Legion warriors rarely fight in the open. At every opportunity, the Raven Guard uses troops as carefully as possible to inflict as much damage as possible on the enemy where he least expects it. At the same time, they try to avoid open clashes. When it comes to the 20th Legion, don't think you see them all. If you take 10, then you don't see a 100. If you see a 100, consider them a 1,000. And if you see only one, then there are all 10,000 of them. Of all the Legiones Astartes, the Alpha Legion is the most mysterious. The Legion is sometimes mentioned in the annals of the Great Crusade, but every note about it invariably contradicts some others. All that is known is that the warriors of the Alpha Legion are unsurpassed masters of tricks and tricks. Most opponents do not even realize that they are already fighting before the skillful stratagems of the Alpha Legion bring down their defenses and tear them apart from the inside. And the last devastating blow falls on the already defeated enemy. Faced with the task of shedding light on the inner workings and structure of the Alpha Legion, one always has to deal with paradoxes and contradictions based on the records of evidence left in the ashes of the crushed worlds where the Legion displayed its art of war. One authoritative report may describe the internal structure of the Legion as multi-level and shrouded in a maze of secrets, while another report, even from a reliable source, may say that the internal structure of the Legion was unexpectedly open and at its core lay equality in which everyone's voice was heard at the Council, regardless of rank and position. However, there are a number of commonplaces, especially in the testimonies about how the Legion fought, and to a certain extent about how it prepared its candidates for war. First, it is the emphasis that the Alpha Legion placed on unity of action and goals in its ranks. Such coordination and impeccable discipline were of primary importance for the rapidly changing adaptive tactics introduced into the Legion by Alpharius, and for the smoothness that characterized the deployment of Legion forces on the battlefield. It has been repeatedly repeated that the future warriors of the Alpha Legion, from the first hours of their stay, as candidates trained and fought together as a unit, and not as individual soldiers, 
Everyone's success and even their survival depended on the success of the whole group. It was said that the exercises and trials that the Legion candidates went through were, in their own way, as deadly as those of all Astartes, but they required both intelligence and interaction to overcome them so that no applicant could survive them alone. The second general observation regarding the Alpha Legion is their supreme mastery of the art of espionage, sabotage, infiltration and liquidation. The purpose of this has always been to decapitate the enemy's ranks to make them helpless puppets before the Legion's attack. Conversely, the Alpha Legion avoided the tactics of war of attrition, forward assault, bloody labour of trench battles and static defence to the last. And if it got involved in them, then on its own terms. However, when the time came for a general attack, it would be a fatal mistake to underestimate the Alpha Legion's ability to openly wage war. Abilities that in practice drew grudging praise from Horus and Sanguinius. The inextricable tactical unity and flexible artificiality in complex stratagems demonstrated by the Alpha Legion in the field of penetration and stealth attacks also made them masters of adaptation maneuvering, feints and ambushes in open combat. Fighting with a multitude of warriors and combat vehicles of the Alpha Legion was akin to fighting with the single huge writhing creature that possesses myriad limbs and stinging fangs, however, acts in obedience to one evil will. 